Welcome back to the APSCC webinar series. I'm Christopher Slaughter, your MC for the series. Today, we tackle the thorny question of what is the future for geo operators? Uh, obviously, geo is uh, uh, the core of the industry, but it's also uh, not exactly the flavor of the month as everybody looks at Leo and some people even talk about Mio. Uh, nonetheless, uh, the future of geo. Uh, this one is brought to you today by KTSAT. We're very pleased to have their support uh, in putting the program together. Uh, and joining us today as the moderator for that is Kevin Choi from KTSAT. He's joined uh, by Nick Leek from Optus and Antonio uh, Alba Martin from Hispasat uh, to talk about the future of geo operators. Please enjoy. Well, uh, welcome to all uh, who listen to this webinar. Uh, I'm Kevin Choi, currently serving as CTO of KTSAT, Korea's only satellite operator and service provider with five geo satellites in our fleet. I'm honored to be here with our with the outstanding expert pan panelists, who are also colleagues of the same satcom industry in different regions of the world. Let me welcome our panelists, uh, Nick and Antonio. I'd like you to introduce yourself briefly, your work, your responsibility, and your company and your fleet, etc. May I hand, hand over to Antonio first? Okay, great. Thank you, first of all, Kevin. Thank you for having me today here in this uh, interesting uh, panel. Uh, I want to thank you also because uh, we are coming from the other side of the world, so I really appreciate that you take uh, us into account, even if we are in a completely different region of the world. I hope we can mix together different views from different angles of, of the world. And uh, to, to introduce myself, I would say I'm the Chief Technical Officer of uh, ISPASAT. Uh, I'm responsible for the definition, the selection of the manufacturer, the follow-up of the program, and the launch of the satellites, as well as their operation while in orbit for the company. And uh, Ispasat is a company, it's a Spanish uh, company with uh, nine satellites in six uh, different uh, orbital positions. We are serving mostly uh, the regions of Europe, North of Africa, and the Americas, both uh, North America and South America. Uh, we have more than 260 transponders in KU and C band, and uh, we have uh, more than 50 uh, K Evan spots already in HTS uh, satellites in orbit. Um, our revenues, our yearly revenues are close to $200 million. And uh, that's it uh, for me. Great, thank you. And how about you, Nick? Hand over to you. Thank you, uh, Kevin. And uh, very nice to meet you and very nice to meet Antonio. Um, look, I'm uh, the head of uh, Optus uh, Satellite and Space Division. Uh, we're a, a division inside uh, Optus, which is the second largest uh, telco in Australia, full service telco, uh, mobile, fixed and satellite. We're probably the only satellite company left within the telco, but uh, we see that as a, as, a, as a great advantage and a great differentiator to our one of our main uh, competitors. Um, if I just move to there, you can you can see our brand. It is yes, yes, Optus. So when customers ask us for things, we say yes. <laughs> we uh, we come currently operate um, five spacecraft. So we are the only owner and operator of satellites in Australia and New Zealand. So mm -hmm. we're currently flying five satellites. Uh, we've built and launched ten. Uh, we also fly uh, the National Broadband Network, which we terminate a uh, call uh, MBN. They have two uh, KA band, uh, 70 gig satellites uh, over Australia, HTS satellites serving the consumer market. Um, our focus, like most regional operators, is traditional delivery of video. Um, and with the incremental revenues for voice and data, including mobile backhaul and in-flight connectivity with one of the local uh, airlines. 
Um, we are actually in the middle of uh, a replacement strategy. Um, so many might have heard that we were the second company after Inmarsat to order an Airbus OneSat platform. Mm -hmm. And we will be the first uh, operator in Asia Pac to launch a fully software defined VHTS spacecraft. But more importantly, we're going to use that spacecraft to, when on launch to basically continue to broadcast uh, video services into New Zealand and configure the rest of the satellite for HDS capacity. So our user case is continue with our traditional video delivery, but configure the space, the other parts of the spacecraft to deliver uh, you know, broadband HTS uh, data and IP services. Um, it's a game changer for us. Uh, I think the HTS software defined spacecraft are game changing for geostationary operators. Um, it widens our footprint uh, which has traditionally been Australia and New Zealand. So we'll cover Asia Pacific as, and far down to the Antarctic. And, uh, you know, we're, we're very excited uh, with that program. And we're also looking at, uh, and that will be Optus 11. And we're also looking at another replacement satellite that we're still working through the business case, uh, which will be Optus 12, utilizing the same software defined HTS satellite. Wow. That's good to hear. It's a very ambitious project. And, uh, you know, I can see that the future is coming for you. Um, well, today we have gathered together, <clears throat> uh, although we are missing uh, Mia Sat, but I think uh, we could have covered four of us, the whole world, actually, because uh, Antonio is covering uh, all Latin American and American market, North American and also Europe, uh, Africa is covered, uh, Asia is covered, and Australia, New Zealand. So maybe the only missing point is some uh, ocean part. Um, being geo-operator, today's subject is actually the future of geo-operators. So although we may not be able to say each one of us uh, as a global uh, coverage player, we can still say a you know very good coverage, although regional. Uh, I'm not even sure whether we can use regional operator as a term. How do you think, uh, Antonio? Um, I'm I'm not especially uh, picky with the naming of the thing, so I don't feel uncomfortable with the term regional operator. Uh, in our case, I think it is uh, the, the, the service area, in our case, is very much uh, linked to cultural's, uh, cultural commonalities uh, that we have with the countries that uh, we serve. So the initial uh, link or the initial reason to extend in the, in the coverages where we are today, it was the, the language, the Spanish and Portuguese uh, speaking countries. And, and there was afterwards an extension, but th this is our base uh, for our service area. And, and we feel uh, quite comfortable with that definition and with this uh, service area. I think that uh, cultural commonalities is uh, part of the basis of our business um, opportunity and the, the value that we can bring to our customers. Great, all right. So let me put, uh... As I just said, the uh, the subject of today's uh, discussion is the future of geo operators. Uh, let me summarize in just a couple of words uh, where we are. To me, the current setcom market is evolving very rapidly, uh, faster than ever. The OTT, the over the top uh, service, is rising, and the uh, direct to home DTH video is becoming more vulnerable in traditional SETCOM market. And the expected bandwidth request uh, increase for UHD, 4K or 8K. Although we are expecting, it's slower than uh, expected increase. So in the daytime trunking, the competition, competition is coming from the uh, terrestrial infrastructure. 
And also on the other side, we have the NGSO uh, non geostationary uh, orbit system is coming with the Starlink could be the pole position now for both uh, B2B and B2C uh, verticals, followed by OneWeb, SESM Power, or Amazon Kuiper. Uh, but their main focus, I believe, is on B2B. Uh, last but not least, the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic situation is accelerating the digital transformation of our society. It will require some, I believe, more bandwidth of the communication. I don't know whether the geo operators are benefiting from that or not. So here we are uh, probably discussing some of these aspects and then uh, what are we are uh, you know, facing and then uh, the challenges, what we want to do, maybe together. So um, before we start, probably uh, I can ask Nick uh, to have some summary because he just passed two full days of Australasia Satellite Forum 2021, yesterday and day before in, in Sydney, I believe. Um, that Can you summarize the outcome of that discussion in just a couple of sentences? Yeah, look, I, I don't think that I can say that there's, there's an outcome because you, you had very uh, differing opinions. And obviously, the uh, non-geostationary discussion was, uh, you know, a very good, robust debate. You know, we mm -hmm. had not just Optus, uh, you know, satellite present, but we had the likes of Intelsat, SES. Um, I was sat next to OneWeb. You know, we so we had a, a very diverse on uh, discussion on day one, you know, about the roles of geostationary satellites, about the influx of non-geostationary services, um, and uh, I think you we we came to a conclusion that there is definitely a role for geostationary spacecraft, especially with the introduction of the you know the software-defined very high-throughput spacecraft. Um, you know, it, this all comes down to the level of investment, um, the level of money to maintain a fleet. So, as you know, a geostationary will, will spend a bit of money, will put a spacecraft up there for 15 years, and you can very easily work out the economics of the cost per megabit in, in that scenario. Um, in, the, in the LEO and MEO environment, we, we've seen enough evidence that... Um, it can be a very expensive uh, mm -hmm. option uh, to enter that market, um, not only to launch a fleet, but actually to have the gateways all over the world to access that fleet in all the different markets, and then to maintain the fleet because you have to continually relaunch spacecraft to, to maintain your network. Mm -hmm. And the other issue that you also have with uh, you know a, a, a large global Leo Mio operation is is access to market so yourselves at kt sat and then antonio with hispasat we know our market we have access to our market we're regulated in that market and and, and we have presence in that market in you know sales marketing regulatory engineering and operations so i think you know the, the question i always have with you know the the uh, leo constellations is that of you know longevity, and you know um, will they will they be there in seven years time? Now, if you're a billionaire, um, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> some of my some of my close friends have given that like a seven year marriage um, that um, somebody might get fed up with just keep putting their hand in their pocket to maintain it. But um, mm. you know, I think there's a complementary play. I, I think we came to the conclusion that um, good operators uh, mm -hmm. might look at a multi-orbital strategy. So SES, they have their M power and they have their Geo. So they've mm -hmm. they've made their multi-orbital play, which I think is is very commendable. You would mm -hmm. see that um, Utilsat has made a five hundred and fifty million dollar investment in OneWeb. So they've made their um, 
you know, their uh, multi-orbital play, which, you know, congratulations to them. Um, I'm not uh, willing to pay that amount of money to buy myself into a, <laughs> into a constellation, but I think you can, you can actually work with the LEO operators. So, you know, we have done a proof of concept uh, with um, Telesat and we are doing a proof of concept uh, with OneWeb out of, out of our Bell Rose Air Station. And, you know, if we see that by working with a, a LEO constellation that is focused on corporate and government, because we're not focused on consumer like um, Starlink is, um, that we, they can help us maybe complement some of the things that we want to do in that corporate and government space. But also, as you suggest, they can give us uh, greater access outside of our normal markets, which is Australia and New Zealand. Right. Now, the second day was even more interesting because the second day was very much focused on um, the Commonwealth and our, our defence capability as a nation. Um, and so there was a lot of talk about one of the major projects in, in Australia where our defence force um, has publicly stated through the government that they're looking at building and launching their own sovereign spacecraft. So uh, obviously Optus is uh, very keen uh, to work with government, as is a lot of other companies, to, to help them achieve their, their own uh, defense satellite network. Hmm. Wow, great. It's, it's, it's a very good summary. I mean, you are almost developing some of our discussion that we'd like to uh, you know, pursue uh, in this webinar. Mm -hmm. Um, let me just go back to Antonio. Um, that you know, having heard that, I, I summarized that yes, there is a room for uh, geo, and uh, we need we can see uh, in seven years' time uh, what that means. The regulation and the market access that we are familiar with is a big advantages. But how do you think the uh, the main challenges uh, that geo operators are facing today? Okay, <clears throat> so I think the first uh, challenge is uh, to maintain our capability as a geo operator for the DTH uh, market. Uh, I think uh, that uh, while there is uh, a lot of discussion in, in Europe and in the US uh, because of the change of the video consumption patterns and uh, the fact that uh, DTH uh, may not be uh, the, our future growth market in, in these regions. I think uh, that uh, at least in our case, we need to uh, take into account like for that for other regions like uh, Latin America, we are convinced that DTH still will be relevant for a significant number of years. Uh, mm -hmm. In those countries where there is not uh, an existing uh, current uh, infrastructure where you can deploy internet uh, networks, uh, we believe that DTH will play a still a key role. This being said, we still see and we still believe that we need to uh, work in trying to adapt our DTH uh, business to this uh, new consumption, this, this uh, new video consumption patterns. And, and we believe that uh, there are some opportunities for uh, doing some uh, over the top uh, platforms uh, via satellite where you can catch uh, part of the content and only refresh uh, via satellite uh, the specific updates of the content. So the idea, mm -hmm. that idea that the OTT is something that needs to be done via terrestrial network is something that uh, I believe we have not been successful up to now to explain mm -hmm. to these players like Netflix and like HBO and Amazon Prime. Or we, we've not... Uh, succeed in explaining to those players that the satellite can still play a role in this OTT market. And I think this is something we should definitely work in the next, uh, in the next years. Now, uh, it is true that uh, there is a transformation of the, of the industry and that uh, connectivity is uh, probably the most uh, relevant uh, growth area for the satellite. And in connectivity, I think uh, the main challenge that is also an opportunity is that uh, we need to make uh, satellites uh, more efficient in the, connectivity, uh, in the connectivity functions. 
We need to build satellites that are more efficient in delivering data in a point-to-point -point, uh, connection more than what we've been doing in broadcast that is a point-to-multipoint uh, connectivity. So we, mm. and, and we need to bear in mind that if we are able to increase, the to improve the efficiency of uh, our connectivity via satellite, we can have a real opportunity. I want to recall that uh, the current uh, satellite uh, business in the overall telecom is uh, something like a 1% of the business. So if the satellite business can only grab another 1% of the overall telecom business, we will mm -hmm. be doubling our existing business. So this transformation of our business into connectivity business, I think it's a great opportunity of growth for all us. There are challenges ahead. There are technical challenges ahead that we need to overcome and we need yeah. to resolve and we need to be, to, to demonstrate that we can <clears throat> deliver data in an efficient manner. But I think it, it, is, it is a great opportunity for the future of the satellite uh, business. Great, um, very nice. I mean, uh, Nick, do you see that uh, depending on the region, uh, we see some of the, uh, how do I say, the difference in the feeling of the market assessments as, as Antonio points out, uh, in Europe or in uh, Latin America, the DTH is still alive and very much is strong uh, in, in the market. Whilst in Korea, for example, uh, we are seeing that there is so much of OTT uh, with the uh, terrestrial infrastructure, which are developing very rapidly. Uh, there's uh, less and less people are feeling really watching television as per se. They are on the uh, mobile phone instead of television. So they don't even know uh, how to turn on the television, you know, these days, because they don't have time. I, in, in some way that, that could be, uh, you know, exported to some other places, but uh, as Antonio says, uh, DTH and probably the, uh, the hybrid OTT plus DTH can play some role. What is the situation in Australia, Anik? Yes, um, I'm, I'm in agreement, violent agreement with Antonio. You know, Australia is a very, very big country. Yeah. And most people live on the eastern seaboard. Um, so there is a requirement um, by the government, for instance, for a free-to-air TV to be distributed to everybody. Um, and we've got the pay TV operators in both uh, New Zealand um, and Australia uh, predominantly deliver all their video channels via satellite. And, and mm -hmm. yeah, we, we've announced um, uh, deals with the uh, Australian pay TV operator, the uh, New Zealand pay TV operator, and our free-to-air operators for, for just over the next 10 years, which kind of underpins our business case for our replacement satellite strategies. Mm -hmm. Now, most of the pay TV operators, their new set-top boxes will all have not only the DVBS tuners for video, but they will all have a, a internet connection so that they're already combining the delivery of video and OTT through their set-top boxes. So mm -hmm. if, if you look at my user habits, um, being of the older generation who can remember how to switch a TV on, you know, <laughs> I, will, I will watch my live sport um, in UHD. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and I will watch my news and I will watch my movies in that, in that environment. And my wife will watch her nice shows on lifestyle and you know the housewives of California and all that type of stuff. Mm. So it's still very popular in, in, in our house. But when we, we retire um, to bed in our other TV, we will stream that content in, in, into, into the bedroom and watch a bit of TV before we, we, we switch the light off. So we're using both technologies in, in that environment. Right. And in terms of technology, so if I give you the case study when we launched the Optus 11 spacecraft, mm -hmm. we will, on one polarization, we will have one beam over New Zealand that is delivering video services. 
And then the other polarization will have up to 20 gigs worth of capacity through spot beam technology. And that will be able to plug your internet into that set top box and deliver IP streaming over the spacecraft. And that's what we're discussing with the pay TV operator of how can we help them then get into becoming ISP for delivery of internet and internet streaming. And then the, also the beauty of these spacecraft mm -hmm. and one, the decision that we made in moving to the new technology, when your markets move, because we, we, nobody can now predict what, what people will want in five years, let alone 10 years, let alone 15 years for the life of our spacecraft. Yeah. We can configure those beams into new markets. We can move capacity into different regions. In, in Australia, New Zealand and New Caledonia, you have the, you know, the, the, the big carnival cruises go around the, the, what they call the Golden Triangle. And you can now oh. actually put a beam over that ship and you can follow it wherever it goes. Yeah, so you can do that for six months of the year. And if, mm -hmm. if you... If you you know, if you need mobile backhaul in a particular place, you can configure your capacity to give it more more throughput so that you can move from a 4G to a 5G capability. And you can do that by configuring your satellite during its 15 year life. So I think that's where the uh, the, the technology changes, Antonio. Again, as I say, you can calculate your, your, your cost per bit. Um, yeah. And it is very cost effective. If, if you have... This, these satellites configured, these Airbus one sat satellites configured, say for a KA spot beam consumer, you know, through that one small spacecraft, you could get up to 250 gigs worth of capacity just for internet delivery. Wow, great. Um, it's uh, somehow you're already giving some ideas on how to, you know, uh, defend ourselves uh, facing the NGS or challenges, etc. I mean, we, uh, Katie said, uh, we are also looking at, uh, you know, various solutions. For example, uh, recently uh, we have developed as part of the mobility solution, a hybrid router, which can connect both satellite and terrestrial network. Mm -hmm. So whenever the, uh, the ship uh, comes into nearby the port, then it automatically uses both satellite and the terrestrial network. Yep. When it moves away, it uh, sticks with the uh, satellite. When by any reason satellite disappear, it connects to another uh, solution. So those hybrid solutions could become uh, a sort of a de facto standard in the, uh, in the mobility market. I was already mentioning one keyword that I wanted to draw uh, somewhere later, but maybe, uh, Antonio can speak about the uh, the preparation that you are doing, as uh, as uh, as Nick said already, that he is uh, investing in uh, HTS, um, and that could be a good solution. Uh, and he mentioned also the uh, the effectiveness of the the cost per gigabit per second, or cost of the data rate, uh, that Geo can stay uh, more competitive. How do you think, uh, in your case, uh, Antonio, uh, what do you prepare for uh, facing these uh, challenges, apart from keeping the, uh, uh, the DTH and OTT market as you wished? But you also mentioned that we need to grab another percent of the connectivity uh, in the overall telecom market. Yes, I, I think that uh, if I have to, to make a simplified uh, uh, market analysis, I, I think that there is a, a very easy one that we can make. And we can wonder ourselves, what do we expect uh, from uh, one internet connection for the next uh, years? Uh, mm -hmm. And I don't know about you, I mean, but for me, the answer is very simple. I am expecting more capacity at less price. So mm -hmm. I think this is the key drivers for looking for these opportunities in the connectivity markets. We need to be able to provide with satellites a larger capacity at lower prices. And, and that, is, that is, I was about to say quite simple. It's, it's simple to say, it's not simple to do. It's simple to say, meaning that uh, we need to increase capacity. 
one of the solution is we need to build larger satellites. So for me, there are two lines of, of actions. One is uh, VHTS satellites that will increase the capacity of uh, that we can offer to our customers while at the same time they are using the scale factor to reduce that uh, unique cost. There are some difficulties uh, for this uh, VHTS because it is not easy to commercialize such a huge amount of uh, capacity. But at some point in time, there is something that there is that possibility and that trend that will probably be used uh, in, the, in the industry. And the second uh, alternative, as uh, Nick uh, was explaining, is uh, software-defined satellites. I think that there are two key elements in software-defined element in software-defined satellites. One is flexibility, as uh, Nick has mentioned. I think flexibility is key for adapting our capacity to the market. So that will allow us to reduce the effective capacity, the capacity, the cost of the capacity sold to the user. That is the real one that is affecting our business cases because we will be able to get closer uh, to the market uh, to the market uh, reality at, uh, at each time. And the, the second element uh, beyond flexibility, I think, is a standardization. And I'm not sure this second line is already, because it is still very uh, incipient, very new, uh, this, uh, this technological trend of software-defined satellites. But I believe that in the future, through a, this, this software defined satellites will be part of a standard uh, offer, a standard product that mm -hmm. will be uh, developed by the, by the manufacturers. And this will allow for them to define uh, their production in a more industrial way, not mm -hmm. making any more those tailor made satellites that we've been using in the past, but making a more serial uh, production that will allow for additional cost uh, reduction by just building a KU satellite. I mean, I think they will have two models. They will have KU or KA. This is, this is what you will choose. And mm. the rest is, is something that you will tune in orbit. And that will allow for a different uh, manufacturing uh, process uh, for, the, for the satellite manufacturing manufacturers. And, and mm. certainly they should have a better results in terms of, uh, of uh, unique cost of the capacity. So I think the target is more capacity, less uh, cost. Mm. And I think these are the, the tools that we have to achieve these, uh, these targets. I mean, I, I fully agree with you. I think uh, Nick uh, has already mentioned also that uh, in his case, uh, the, uh, the cost per gigabit per second is also key that he had to choose this uh, software defined satellite, uh, one set he has ordered, um, and you are on the same line. And we all talk about the same thing. And to reduce the cost, obviously, we need to make the standard product industrialized. It's a new Fordism uh, in the space industry that so far we are building our satellite per specification of each individual operator, but now it will become more standard product. Mm. But by saying so, we are still talking about, I don't know, uh, maybe maximum 10, 20 geo satellites to be built uh, per year for all our industry. Whilst if we, look at the LEO side or NGSO, they are talking about hundreds, if not thousands of satellites to be built in the same series. So somewhere, um, don't you think the, uh, the challenge in this uh, you know, uh, drive of the uh, cost per bit, uh, are we having any kind of uh, disadvantages compared to the LEO side? Um, uh -huh. There, there, are, there are several several ways to, to respond or several aspects to respond. The first thing is, as you are saying, they are talking. So for the moment, the only one, we have only seen one constellation that has reached the 1,000 satellites in orbit. 
Many of them are talking, we're seeing one. We'll see, we'll see if that is true or not. And this is something that we'll have to see. And as Nick is also saying, we'll have to see where they are in seven years from now. But yeah, I mean, uh, you're, you're probably right. And, and as a general comment, I, I think that it makes sense what you're saying. The number of satellites required in, a, in Constellation is larger than this number of satellites that are required for the same service in your stationary orbit. That is true, and that will drive the number of satellites to be manufactured. However, I still believe uh, that there are, and I think that uh, we have a good uh, example of that. There is some cross-fertilization from LEO to GEO that we are starting to see. And I believe that uh, the OneSat uh, result, the OneSat uh, design has a lot to do with what uh, Airbus has learned in OneWeb. So I believe that uh, the, the change in the industry coming from the constellation is not something that is going to benefit only uh, to the constellation itself. I think mm -hmm. that this is going to change all the way the industry is, uh, is uh, working and uh, developing a new satellite. So I think this will be something beneficial for, for both parties. And in, in any case, and, and, and I'm not sure if you want to talk about this now, but uh, I still believe that uh, for the constellation, uh, the, the markets uh, that uh, they can effectively address uh, they are not necessarily the same markets where the geostationary satellites are good at. And, and I think that, uh, that uh, constellations, they can be good for B2B uh, with very specific requirements like uh, low latency. So mm -hmm. uh, to put it clear, I really don't see how constellations uh, will compete uh, with geosatellites in, uh, in residential broadband. I don't believe they can compete with the ground terminals that are mm -hmm. costing less than $300, while the terminals for the constellation are, are costing $3,000. And that relative mm -hmm. difference between, I'm not saying that they, they can make it better and that constellation yep. will decrease their cost, but yep. I think there will be always a relative difference between mm -hmm. the, the te one terminal that is fixed to a point in the space and one terminal that needs to have two receivers that are moving very mm -hmm. fast in order to track uh, two satellites. It, mm -hmm. This cannot have the same cost. Whatever the technology evolves, whatever the, the evolution it, it takes in the, in the constellation terminals, it will yeah. be way cheaper for the, for the, for the geosatellites. So I think, and I'm not saying that we are not interested and although we should not be looking <laughs> at constellation. Yeah. What I'm saying is that there are markets that are very well served by geostationary satellite, and we need to keep doing things well on the geostationary satellite. There are some other markets for which the constellations are good, and I think we need to consider the right approach for the constellation. And like Nick was saying, we've been also looking at in the past to different opportunities in constellation, and we never got the right opportunity. So we'll have to look at it. We are even now participating with the European uh, Union with the European Commission in a study yeah. for developing an European uh, constellation. Mm. But we need to identify clearly what is the right use and what is the right target for this uh, constellation. I don't think the constellation is the one solution for all the problems. Wow, I mean, that, that's a good point. I and mean, somewhere you already mentioned that the uh, you know, the, the commonality of the technology, which can benefit both Leo and Geo, so that the, uh, the series of manufacturing that makes hundreds of satellites will also drive the cost reduction of the Geo satellite. I think somehow I agree with you in that uh, side, but still I have some, you know, feeling that uh, number still can say something, but you can also ask Nick, because that he mentioned already the, uh, the cruise uh, services where it falls into the mobility. If it's a residential area, obviously the, uh, the geo has a clear advantages in the terminal side. The Leo needs to track multiple satellites uh, that will increase the cost of the terminal. But when it comes to mobility, um, Nick has chosen one set 
but I mean, you have done already the, the proof of concept with Telesat, as you mentioned. Uh, what did you learn from the Leo uh, side? And uh, why do you think is Geo is still, uh, you know, have advantages of this mobility market? Oh, look, um, it was a, it was a wow. It's the, it was the first version of the um, Telesat with their single satellite. So, you know, and and the, and the results were, were were pretty good in terms of you know the upload and download speeds. Mm -hmm. um, no, I look, and, and at the end of the day, um, if you look at OneWeb, they're looking at potentially two terminals but if you if you look at starlink they they believe that they've developed the the single self-installed antenna um, which they're petering in in north america um, so they think that they've actually solved that it is you know it, it probably is heavily subsidized um, and it is consumer focused it's, it's not b2b it's not b2c it's, it's all about retail sales on the website a fixed cost which is translated into the cost of the currency of the of the country that it's in, um, but you know in in Australia that consumer market is purely served by our MBN, our national broadband spacecrafts, SkyMaster One and SkyMaster Two. Um, so it's it's kind of difficult to see where some of these Leos are going to play in 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 the market. Now the other thing that's to be tested is how do they operate in a congested market? Um, how much real capacity do you get per satellite over the region when it's whizzing over? Um, mm -hmm. and, and we've done our own kind of calculations and you can have a, theory, a theoretical calculation, which I'm sure you and Antonio know when you're, when you're trying to design and build your own spacecraft, but when you get it up there, you know, the actual real throughput of spacecraft is, is, is when That's you right. get it and you start looking at it so yeah. yes i think there's lots of unknowns in terms of leo yeah. I think there's still the big question of viability you can't keep subsidizing you no know, matter how much money you're you've got as a billionaire um and then we when then we don't fully understand performance i think the likes of telesat and OneWeb that are focused on the b2b um, are likely uh, to have more success because they're looking at the corporate and government markets the mobility markets there is a suggestion from those players that you know the majority of in-flight connectivity will all go on to leo spacecraft um in the future i think the uh, the ifc markets still trying to um smooth out the handover between additional uh, you know satellites without trying to work out the technology and trying to pick up multiple spacecraft flying across you know the the orbit when you've got a when you've got an airplane flying and how that mm. wi-fi connection is, is going to be maintained you know we haven't even mm. solved it for geostationary handover so i think there's a lot of unknowns uh, there is That's something I would, I would like to add uh, i i agree 100 percent with uh, nick uh, yeah. i think he has pointed the right uh, the right things uh, but i wanted to add that uh, uh, the uh, mobility market uh, is still not available for Constellation. In order to have uh, the mobility market available, Constellations, they need to develop inter-satellite links, which are not available today. So let, let's be clear. Uh, current Constellations are not having, OneWeb is not having inter-satellite link. Uh, Starlink, uh, I think I was reading yesterday that out of 1,400 satellites, there are now 10 satellites. They claim that there are 10 satellites with inter-satellite link. So yeah. if somebody wants to make connectivity, in-flight connectivity with the, uh, with Constellation, this is something that cannot be done today. So mm -hmm. only geosatellites can provide that in-flight connectivity. This being yeah. said, I still, I still insist that, yes, there is less difference between the two terminals in the case of mobility, but mm -hmm. still for Constellation, you need a terminal with two receivers which is make it, as, as Nick has mentioned, complicated in some cases, the integrations of those terminals in the, in the airplanes. Don't forget that. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. third thing is that when constellations will have solved the two main issues, that is inter-satellite link and double receiver, we still mm -hmm. need to see, as Nick is saying, what is the real throughput that they can provide. And we need to see what is the response of the airlines 
in terms of they will have to change the terminal for a new one to adapt constellations. And you know that this is one of the bottlenecks of the airline industry to change terminals in the airplanes because they need to stop the plane to change terminal. So it, it is not clear and there is a lot of uncertainties with mm -hmm. respect to mobility in, in, in LEO, in Constellation uh, satellites. Yeah, yeah. I mean, somewhere, I, I think we are all agreeing on you know, the, the several drawbacks of the LEO system having this uh, you know, missing ISL, as you mentioned, and the two receiver problems, and the, the cost of the uh, terminal, obviously, uh, that's the result of that, and effective capacity, or sellable capacity, in other words, that is not the, uh, you know, the sum of the, the capacities of each individual satellite can right. achieve, because in various areas, the satellite sees over the ocean that no customer, no clients are actually available to use that capacity. So there are many things that we need to look at, but I mean, with all these constraints that we have developed, everyone knows somehow, but there are still this development of the, uh, of the Leo. Maybe it's the game of the billionaires. Maybe it's the, uh, it's the, uh, you know, there's something that we can do. I, I'm, probably asking myself, but uh, I'll turn over to you, uh, uh, Nick and Antonio. If the technology trend is uh, progressing rapidly, because we have already seen the development of one web, or even without mentioning the, uh, the initial Iridium and Global Star uh, constellation 20 years ago, now the technology has achieved a lot more. Now, within three, four years time, we can even further reduce the price of the uh, satellite in Leo and affordable uh, for more or less you know, all operators having the ISL and also you know, attractive B2B market which develop uh, now on and, uh, and uh, in the near future. Do you think that uh, the Leo will develop some advantages and then play also a very good role in the telecom market so that we may be able to, you know, or may be interested in investing in those parts. How do you think, Nick? Oh, look, I'm, I'm quite sure that there will be technology advantages or advances in, in, in the, you know, Leo spacecraft into satellite yeah. links. You know, they, they, you know, as we, as we launch new geo spacecraft, we'll have into satellite links to Leos and Mios. So mm -hmm. I just think, you know, maybe in 10, 15 years time, you'll, you'll have an ecosystem that will contain all three orbital locations and you'll be moving traffic around the world on spacecraft like we've never seen before but i don't know whether that will happen <laughs> but i've certainly been tasked to look at it <laughs> good and antonio i know that I, you're looking at it also isn't it uh, i am i am a bit more optimistic than nick uh, i believe um, i want to believe that this uh, this will happen in fact we believe that uh, the future is multi-orbital. We believe that in the future, we will have uh, geosatellites uh, for certain applications and LEO mm -hmm. satellite uh, for other applications. Mm -hmm. And we also believe uh, that uh, technology evolution in the next uh, years is going to provide a significant uh, impact in the cost uh, reduction of uh, these uh, systems and we, I, we are convinced that they will make it uh, more affordable and it will allow at the end of the day, as we mentioned, to provide ca more capacity at uh, lower cost. And in the case of uh, Constellation with the very low latency, that it mm -hmm. will allow for new services that we are starting to, uh, to, to imagine and to define. And, and I think that, uh, that this is the, the direction of the future. So we're certainly looking at that. And we believe, as I've said, that the, that the future is multi-orbital. Right. I agree, Antonio. I was being a bit uh, flippant. 
and you know and and there are, there are other you know areas where geo you know has a role to play mm-hmm. you know on, on a lot of these new spacecraft there's opportunities for hosted payloads mm-hmm. um you know optical payloads you know um, earth observation you know fire detection you know in australia our uh, one of our departments called geoscience is looking to implement a similar system in in europe like egnos so you know mm-hmm. so there's so there's there's still lots of things that that we can do uh, with technology you know australia has right. now had a space agency going for the last couple of years they've got a whole bunch of um different areas of space that they're looking at um and it needs experienced companies like hispasat ktsat optus miasat you know those people that have got experience of building operating and flying satellites you know it 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 doesn't matter what payload you put on there somebody's still got to manage and operate those things um okay. so i think there's, there's there's great opportunity there will mm-hmm. be a multi-orbit strategy for us all in the future mm-hmm. and uh, i wish both your companies every success <laughs> thank you um what well, let, let me raise the question um today we are talking about billion dollar investment in the uh, in the leo constellation isn't it um we know that uh, one web uh, had uh, already spent some billions uh before going through a uh, bankrupt protection and uh, uh we don't know exactly how much does it cost uh, starling but we are all talking about billions maybe 10 billion you know um but thanks to the uh, technology advancement let's say we achieve a tenth of the you know of the today's cost to build same size of the constellation will you be interested in uh, investing in it in leo system having some i mean all those drawbacks we already listed but one particular element that uh, the leo is quite good at is the latency issue yeah look i i um i don't discount us looking at investing in a leo constant constellation and i'd like to see you know a bit more advancement in technology but um yeah. you know I, i i do think there is an opportunity for uh, as you suggest um regional operators potentially saying well yes there is an opportunity there um mm-hmm. but we might want to design it in a different way uh, and, and with different features and capabilities um yeah. that, that help complement you know our our existing businesses yeah 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 also, also in our in our case uh as as we have discussed uh, it's uh, it's something that we are certainly looking at uh, as i mentioned we are already participating in a study with the european uh, commission and uh, mm-hmm. we are uh, interested in developing that uh, that constellation and we are also in general open to discuss Uh, potential cooperation with the other operators in order to define this uh, or to design these uh, future opportunities through the the leo constellations definitely as i said the uh, leo constellation will allow us to provide new services that we were not able to provide up to now and certainly mm-hmm. those would be good opportunities in the future and uh, mm-hmm. the federation of uh, operators uh, interest Uh, we believe that in the next year is going to be a, a very good way to approach and to uh, to consider these uh, these opportunities where you have a uh, global coverage where you need to have a wider market that, that we are considering today and and it will help uh, reducing the risk and uh, um, enriching those wider market that uh, we are uh, targeting today right well I mean, it's all, it all sounds good. The only trouble probably is that uh, by the time the technology allows us to consider investing in Leo or Mio, all the filings and priorities and all these parts belongs to uh, four or five major constellations already built and occupying the space with hundreds if not a thousand of satellites um don't you see any risk on that side as well 
So I, I pointed you? that out in my you? first, yeah, I pointed that out in my in one of my first um, um, discussion topics that spectrum and market access is one of the big issues that the Leo constellations have. Mm. I mean, there is a this spectrum filing, but there's also the regulatory issues of each countries. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. And Antonio, uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, well, the way I see it is first, it is true that there is a lot of uh, filings today uh, for Leo constellation. There are large amount of them. We have also our own filing uh, for mm -hmm. uh, constellation. Uh, I believe that the majority of this constellation, and I hope it is not ours, and the majority of this constellation will not happen. I think there is a lot of uh, uh, a lot of a bubble, sort of a bubble of yeah. uh, of uh, constellation filing. So th there will be a reduced uh, number of uh, constellations. This is point number one. Point number two, it is it's a bit more complicated, but. Uh, I recognize what you are saying, and we need to be careful, and we need to make sure that uh, we can have access uh, to frequencies and filing. I think, and I hope, this will be the role of the of the different uh, governing bodies taking care of this. Um, but I believe that there is some technical improvement uh, that can be made in the uh, way constellations can live uh, together. Uh, let me try to explain. Uh, as of today, the way the filings are defined, it, it is a, let's say, a kind of reactive way. I mean, the, 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 the ITU is receiving proposals from different uh, constellations and, and they admit it and, and they put it in a list. And if you come new to the list, you, you need to demonstrate that uh, you are not creating any interference to the ones that have more priority than you did. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that uh, it, it could be possible with a more proactive role of this, uh, of this uh, frequency um, uh, authorities, it will be possible, uh, if they are more proactive, it will be possible to coexist uh, a larger number of uh, constellations if they take a proactive role. So if instead of just leaving uh, to everybody the possibility to define what how they want to uh, create their, uh, their uh, constellation, there are some very minimal rules on, mm -hmm. on how to build constellation and how to shift one constellation from the other. If there mm -hmm. is a minimal rule if there are minimal rules of the way to shift one constellation with the other, I believe that the numbers of constellations that will coexist will increase uh, significantly. And I think, and I think this is something that should be seriously considered by the different uh, countries uh, participating in these governing bodies. Because at the end of the day, I think it is good for the society and it is good for the world that there will be more um, capacity and that there will be more constellations that mm -hmm. uh, simple three or four constellations in the in the world. So I think that it is possible certainly to increase the number of potential constellations. Yeah. And, um, and I think this is something that should be considered by the different uh, authorities. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think you are making a good point that the uh, I mean, today we are talking about uh, three, four major constellations or mega constellations. But it, you know, while European you know, European Union is moving ahead uh, with assembly of all the European partners uh, to make their own uh, constellation definition, and uh, let's not forget that China has uh, their own constellation projects. They have announced some uh, some weeks ago, uh, GW constellation, which is another one that we are not very well aware of. India may be considering their own. I mean, there are several others uh, who are already talking about these things. And as as Antonio points out, that there must be something that we can do together uh, to make more participants to play in the game, so that 
the customers can benefit from the competition, from the availability of the uh, bandwidth that we can offer, and those who are willing to you know, add on additional services on top of the connectivity will have uh, more success uh, than just providing the uh, connectivity with more or less uh, the uh, similar latency, isn't it? I don't know how Nick uh, think of or has anything that you want to suggest uh, from uh, Australian, New Zealand uh, area? Uh, the, the only thing I would say is that, you know, the, the constellations you're talking about at the moment are the kind of the uh, consumer business to business type fixed antenna or even the two antenna services. The, the one that um, really interests me is the is the the new ones that are looking at delivering signals to the mm -hmm. to the mobile device mobile you know, 4g and 5g services to the device yeah. so that, that, that would be a little bit more interesting because mm -hmm. you know the countries of the world that don't have mobile mm -hmm. coverage mm -hmm. if you can deliver to a phone because most people as you know in, in certainly in southeast asia they don't have fixed connections you know our children and our grandchildren don't have fixed connections they all do their their videos their texting mm. their email through the device so that that would be something that would be a, a, a very interesting as that technology starts to develop right. because then mm -hmm. you're differentiating the service that you're actually trying to provide yeah yeah i mean somehow we are all going towards the same direction uh, antonio mentioned that you know yes there is a multi orbit uh, infrastructure that we need, we can foresee in the near future and you are mentioning very interesting point also that the telecom somehow is linked with the uh, standard that our mobile phone can uh, send and receive directly uh, signals wherever we are I mean, today we are talking about the terrestrial or Earth. Uh, in the coming years, it may be the uh, you know the telephone on the moon that we can connect and then discuss together. So we are still going forward to a broader and bigger market and uh, and all these uh, prospects. But there are things that we can still uh, you know consider and we need to resolve is that. The frequency is still uh, a scare, rare uh, resources that we need to take care of and then use it really efficiently. So it could be that you, know, you me, I mean, not, not just as, a, as an individual, but as a company or as an authority or country that we can you know, discuss together hands in hand and to see how we can federate, how we can, you know, uh, move forward for the benefit of everyone. And uh, I don't know, I don't want to say monopoly, but somehow today we are feeling, at least myself, feeling that uh, we are left over by some big dominant players. Well, and, uh, I, I, think, I think I need to react to that because uh, yeah. we are, we have just started a very interesting program uh, with the European Space Agency for lunar communications, and we are really mm -hmm. excited to, to participate to that. We believe, oh. we believe that uh, in space exploration, uh, private-public uh, partnerships will be key for the next age of uh, space exploration. So different from the 60s with NASA and the big agencies, I think that the situation today is different and it will be key the participation of private uh, players in the next stage of uh, the space uh, the space exploration and we certainly from Ispasa we want to play a role there and, and like I say we, we're starting a, a, a very interesting study for lunar communication so I really mm -hmm. hope and, and I really believe that in the future as you are saying astronauts uh, from the surface of the moon they will be using uh, some uh, intercom, some kind of uh, cell phone to talk yeah. to uh, to the control center in, in, on Earth. So this 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 is something I really I really hope. Now, in general, 
to what you are saying about the evolution of the communications, I think uh, that one of the keys um, for the for the future is the integration of the satellite uh, infrastructure with the terrestrial infrastructure. I believe that the customers are not interested in the technology. They are not interested whether their signal goes by satellite or by terrestrial. They just want to have services. We have been living in a niche uh, business for the last 40 years, and I think that the time has come for us to start understanding that we need to integrate in the telecom uh, business. And this is this big overall telecom business that I mentioned where we are just 1% of that. And we need to integrate there. And I think that there are good opportunities as long as we learn how to integrate there. And I believe that uh, one key technology for the integration will be optical communications. We believe that optical communications will allow for a seamless integration of the satellite infrastructure with the terrestrial infrastructure, creating gateways that will make that the satellite becomes a node of the overall infrastructure. And uh, it will be, I mean, and it will be seamless to the customer and, and, and whether the signal, the, his communication is going via the terrestrial infrastructure or for whatever the reason, at some point in time, it, it should be possible to switch in real time and to change that communication to the satellite to reroute through whatever the, the, the needed means. So we believe that optical techno, optical communications will be key in the in the future for that integration. Wow. And I don't want to finish this uh, this chat without mentioning something that uh, we are also starting to to develop, and I, we believe that it will it, it will have a significance. Probably not in the next five years. We expect to do something in five years, but it will become relevant uh, in ten years from now. That is quantum communications. You know that quantum mm -hmm. communication, quantum computing and quantum communication is becoming a very relevant area uh, of the development. You know that uh, the terrestrial infrastructure has an inherent uh, limit of 100 kilometers to transmit uh, quantum uh, mm -hmm. information. Because of that, the satellites, I think that they will have to play a significant role in quantum communication. We are starting now the definition of uh, the first ap application of quantum uh, quantum communication in a quantum key distribution mission that we expect to fly at the end of 2025. And like I said, it will it will ramp up slowly, but we believe that uh, in the in the next decade we will see a lot of uh, quantum key distribution system via satellite, and we will see a lot of uh, um, quantum computers connected uh, by by satellites. Right. Thank you. I, I think that that's, uh, you know, the, the keyword is, is very good. Uh, I mean, today I started with the question of the future of the geo operator. Um, we have gone through, uh, you know, various places. We have analyzed the LEO system, their drawbacks. We have mentioned, that obviously, uh, the advantage of LEO having the low latency, and we appreciate that. And what Nick and, uh, and Antonio, uh, and I agree with you both, that it's not the uh, LEO Geo. We are all talking about the communication and connectivity, where we can actually provide a very low cost in high quality service, we'll go for it. And for the moment, we are a bit reluctant uh, going into Leo due to their uh, effectiveness of the communication. The, uh, the topology and the you know, construction is more costly than we think. Uh, we are looking for the opportunity. Uh, if it's affordable and if it's good enough, then we'll obviously integrate within our services, but Leo is just one side of the, uh, of the photo. We need to go beyond uh, geo into deep space in the lunar and the Mars probably communications. So somewhere geo operators needs to pave the way to put the information highway, either using RF or optical quantum 
you know, laser. So all these nice words that I think I'm quite happy to hear from you both, that I'm not the only one uh, in Korea talking about with my colleagues in, in Korea. Uh, I think I have more or less uh, you know, summarized those words that we have exchanged. Maybe can, I can hand over to, uh, to you both. Nick, uh, um, do you want to say something that I forgot or about the future of uh, Optus? No, no, I think, uh, yeah, I, what, one thing I started and Antonio just finished on is about integrating with the telco. I can assure you I'm fully integrated with the telco. <laughs> 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 you know, the yeah the, the software defined spacecraft will be part of the you know the sd1 network so to speak oh um good. you know we've already developed a a a software defined small cell radio system for our mobile backhaul um so you know we, we were kind of the, the the first part of the mobile network that was fully fully software defined um so it's uh, yeah, I, I I totally agree. We we will we will use technology as we see it and as we develop it and as we define it. And I think you know all three companies have got a, a great role to play in our markets and in our expanding markets. Um, exactly. So, <laughs> so I've got no nothing further to add. <laughs> all right, good. Thank you, uh, and Antonio. I'm I'm good. Thank you. Just to thank you again for the for the opportunity, and uh, and if I may insist uh, one more, as uh, Nick uh, and you both have uh, uh, said, uh, we believe that uh, there is a very interesting uh, future. There are very interesting challenges ahead, mm -hmm. and uh, these challenges uh, they will become opportunities for yeah. our companies and for the development of new uh, satellites, new satellite services, and we hope so. Great. Well, this may be the you know the first uh, forum that we met together uh, and exchange our opinions. But I I think uh, maybe you agree that it's not the last one. I mean, somewhere we need to discuss further, uh, online, offline. You you both are welcome to uh, come to Korea, and I'll and I'll certainly visit your place or even online. You know, mm -hmm. we have many things to do and uh, probably together uh, all those different technologies that we want to integrate we would like to serve our customer the best connectivity that we can actually offer yeah is it, a, is it a good uh, future for the uh, geo operator <laughs> yes i think so <laughs> thank you very much for your time for your kindness uh, in this uh, webinar I like to uh, conclude today's session, but our journey, our discussion will continue in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. We hope so. Thank you, Nick, and thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much for that, Kevin. Thank you, Nick, and thank you, Antonio. We really appreciate your, your, your time, your input, uh, and we look forward to seeing how many of these predictions about the future of geo operators will actually come to fruition. Uh, thank you very much to KTSAT also for sponsoring this week's webinar. We do appreciate uh, their ongoing support for APSCC and the webinar series. Uh, speaking of the series, uh, obviously you're watching this uh, and so you have registered uh, at APSCCSAT.com, uh, but you can also check out uh, the upcoming webinars that we have listed on the website there, APSCCSAT.com, uh, where you registered, where you should be watching this. Uh, and please do join us next week. Uh, we have a webinar sponsored by UTELSAT, uh, which is Satellite Networks as a Service. Uh, you want to find out more about that, please do join us. Uh, that's next week here on the APSCC 2021 webinar series. Thanks, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.